Okay, so I'm going to give you a little lesson, and it is a lesson, about dust emissions in the dust emission mechanisms in the Sahara. Um, I'm giving the talk, but the work represents the efforts of many more people than I, and some of those contributors are listed there. Um, okay, so there's an animation going on there on the screen, and the point of this is to really illustrate that there is a lot of stuff up there in the atmosphere that we can't see. Um, aerosols are tiny microscopic particles that play a big role in the climate system. Um, so there are a couple of uh, points here listed about the various feedbacks and impacts that they have. Um, and this is kind of the key motivator to some of the work that we're doing in this department. It's essential that we represent aerosol processes in climate models for the predictions to be as accurate as possible. And we focus on mineral dust here because it's the most abundant of all of the aerosol species. Um, so yeah, the, the kind of the key justification is that we need to represent the feedbacks in climate models and Earth system models. Um, and the first step here is accurately simulating the emission of dust from desert environments, dry land environments. When it comes to the emission of dust, there's really one key global player, and that's the Sahara Desert. Um, there are two, two stories to tell about Saharan <coughs> dust. One of them is in the Bedelli Depression in Chad, and that's a story that's been told very well in the past few years by Richard Washington and Sebastian, who just spoke to you. Unfortunately, I can't tell you that story because I don't have time, but I'm going to take you to an area to the west of that called the Central and Western Sahara. This is an area that we don't really know very much about at all. Um, each of these green blobs is a weather station um, that takes routine meteorological measurements and dust measurements. And you can see that there's a pretty big area there that has no weather stations whatsoever. It's a big meteorological hole, effectively. To give you some context, the map here shows you that the land mass that's covered, it is a vast area. And if you look at the density of uh, weather monitoring stations in the UK, you can see that there's a big hole in our knowledge there. And you know, we sometimes like to complain about the weather forecast in the UK. Imagine what it's like for the Sahara. <laughs> um, there's a, a plot here which is uh, highlighting a dust hotspot. So this is a dust detection scheme that we've developed here in Oxford. And the red shading corresponds to a frequency of about 25% of the time. So if you were to look at that spot in the Sahara, 25% of the time there would be dust there. And this is a conservative estimate of dust coverage. The question that we've been tackling is, what is with that dust? Why is it there? Where does it come from? Um, what meteorological mechanisms drive the emission of that dust? And that's what I'm going to talk about. There are two key mechanisms that act in this part of the Sahara. One of them is the low-level jet. So this is a, effectively a low-level wind speed maxima that picks up in the early morning. What you're looking at here is a satellite image. It's obviously false color. Um, and the pink plumes you see there are dust. And this is an incredibly regular, well-understood process. It occurs on about 30% of the nights over deserts. And if those wind speeds peak over areas that are characterized by very fine sediment, the sediment gets picked up and blown away. Uh, the second key mechanism that operates is um, outflow from convective storms. So if you look at the southern edge of this image, wait for it to loop around again, you see a big front of dust being thrown up into Algeria. Um, the convective outflow, if effectively, it's related to thunderstorms or thunderstorm-like systems that develop in the southern Sahara, these red blobs here and you get really strong, gusty winds that rush out from the storms, can propagate for hundreds of kilometers, and they pick up dust if there are very small sand particles, which is dust if there is any in the way. The question, uh, sorry, one, these do look incredibly spectacular on the surface. So this is um, a convective outflow event. It's otherwise known as a haboob, um, and these are really dramatic walls of dust that rage across the desert. This here is um, the result of one particularly large convective outflow event, and that's a huge area covered by dust, and it, you, know, you can imagine that that's playing all sorts of games with the energy budget in the atmosphere. The question that we've been trying to answer is, how much dust do these different mechanisms exist? How important are these different mechanisms? There are two ways to answer that question. The first way is to go to the Sahara and try to study the dust in situ and attribute a mechanism to the dust that you're seeing. I've circled this green dot here. This is Borj Mukhtar. Um, and this is a site that in the recent Fennec campaign was instrumented very heavily. Um, lots of meteorological and dust data were collected here, creating a treasure trove of information. Um, and Christopher Allen, who sits among you, um, he did some really detailed detective work to try to ascribe a proportion of that dust to the different mechanisms. 
what we're interested in in particular are the convective outflows. And you can see that around about 70% of the dust observed in Borj Mukhtar is attributed to these convective outflow events. That's all well and good, but that's one point in the Sahara. So some work that I've been involved in is trying to say how much dust comes from different sources and is associated with those events. So you can see that these are, this is a source map of this area, and there are p particular hotspots that emit dust preferentially over others. Um, we're going to focus on this area here. Um, this is a very busy plot, so to highlight what you want to look at, the colour is all important. So the yellows, the oranges and the reds highlight very big contribution from convective outflow events, whereas the blues are very strong link to low-level jets. And you can see that in the southern Sahara, convective outflows are incredibly important in leading to the emission of dust. Um, so on average, about 60% of the observed events here are linked to convective outflows. OK, great. What does that mean for our efforts to model, uh, to model the emission of dust in climate models? What, we're what modelers are trying to represent is this pattern here. You want to see clear hotspots of emission. What models actually show is very different. Um, obviously, the scale of these two images is, is very different. This is a much more detailed image than that. But they're missing a key area of emission in the southern Sahara. And the reason, the reason that that happens is actually very simple. It's almost an impossible task for the models because <laughs> they're operating in a scale that simply cannot capture the convective outflow events. The events are literally missing from the models, so the mechanism that's driving the high wind speeds isn't there. Therefore, the dust just cannot be picked up. Um, and that's the take-home message, really, that I want to leave you with. Not a very happy one, but there is a lot of dust missing from the models in the Sahara, and the reason for this is that climate models do not operate at a high enough spatial resolution to simulate the processes that are important. I should point out, I'm talking about climate models here, regional weather prediction models can simulate these processes, but they do not run at the timescales necessary for climate prediction. Thank you very much.